Hello, world. I'm Puck. I'm 15. And this year, I celebrate my 10th anniversary as a programmer. You might. Uh, you might wonder what, how it all started. When I was around five, three, my parents bought an old iMac for me to tinker with, and so I would stay away from the family computer, which contained their work stuff. And because it was my computer, I could do with it whatever I wanted, as long as it could still read the reinstall disk at the end of the day. So, at first, I was playing games, but soon I started to explore the internet, looking at different websites, comparing the code, and learning all about markup languages. I read about HTML and other languages too. But I had to do it all by myself, because I never met another coder at that time. And at the age of six, I was perfectly able to create small websites and write small scripts in JavaScript and PHP. I was fascinated by this language. I spent all of my free time working on my coding. The computer was my playground, and both school and my parents saw that it was a way to express myself, and that, well, that it made me happy. I even coded when I was away from the computer, just by writing small scripts with pen and paper. For me, learning these languages was like learning English or Dutch. First, you have to know letters, then words or short, simple sentences, and eventually you can read and write anything. And when you know the basics of the language part of coding, you can start making things. And when you start making things, you'll have to develop your better skills, like computational thinking, analyzing and structuring problems before you can start solving them. This is a very helpful skill in any field of work and something every kid can benefit from. So why isn't coding a regular subject in school? Well, luckily for me, I did get to code in school, but that's only because I just did it and no one stopped me. <laughs> like this case when I was around seven years old. A couple of kids wanted to play Twister during lunch break, but the dial was broken and we couldn't play. So the teacher said to me, go and make a new dial. She meant with cardboard and glue, but instead, I used a computer. <laughs> you don't need to know a whole lot of coding to start making things. The Twitter dial here isn't very complicated. It's mostly about knowing the right words to talk to the computer. So I first define the body parts and the colors. Then I let the computer choose a random body part and a random color. And then I display on the screen the body part, then on, and then the color, for example, left foot on yellow, or left hand on green, or right foot on red. But when you start working on more complicated stuff, you'll have to start thinking like a programmer as well. For example, if possible, I try to divide my problems into bite-sized pieces that I can solve one at a time. And to show you what I mean, I made a maze generator that generates a random maze and I'm going to live code a simple maze-solving robot to solve that maze. Well, a well-known method for solving any most mazes is the left-hand method, always following one hall, wall, for example, the left. And this will work with the maze my generator generates, so this is the, this is the method I'm going to use. So, it, I have a maze-solving robot, that can do three things, turn left, turn right, and move forward. Uh, move for can make a copy of itself, too. And this maze solving robot in the top left corner of the maze, facing right, and that looks a bit like this. And I'm going to live code logic to make this maze solving robot solve the maze. So first, the robot is going to uh, it's going to turn left, because we are following the left wall. And then, it's going to try to make a copy of itself. And if that, su if that succeeds, 
that copy is going to turn left, try to make a copy of itself, etc. But if that copy didn't find an endpoint or there's a wall there, that original robot is going to turn right and try again. And this will happen for each of the three directions, left, forward, and right. <laughs> and if I now run this code, these maze-solving robots will fill the entire maze because they haven't yet got the logic to know which part where the endpoint is. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do now. If a robot finds the endpoint, it will uh, signal that back to all its parent robots, and then once it reaches the original robot, there will be a line drawn from the start to the finish. And that would look something like this. So it's maze something robots still try to fill the entire maze, but once one reaches the end point, it uh, stops. <laughs> so in around two minutes and with like 10 lines of code, I've made a very simple maze solving robot that can solve basically any maze. Kids that go to my school get 35 hours of computer sciences in the first three years, teaching them how to use PowerPoint and how to search the internet. <laughs> but they have around 1,000 hours for learning languages like English, Dutch, German, French, and for some even Latin and Greek. So I was thinking, what if more of the time spent on teaching children languages is used on teaching children a new modern language like Python or C Sharp? <laughs> and of course, why not start from an even younger age, just like I did? Of course, not all children will have to become programmers, just like they don't all have to become mathematicians just because they have maths. By teaching them to code, they will improve their computational skills, and it will give them more understanding of the computerized world we live in. They will not only learn that they can change this environment, this world, but it will also get the tools to actually change it. Children can be makers or innovators, and they will become better thinkers. <laughs>